Yeah, hey everyone, good afternoon. Hope you're all doing well. First of all, thanks for joining us today. I am Sebastian Bernal, a third year electrical and computer engineering student here at Carnegie Mellon. I'm also one of the community outreach chairs for the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. We're an organization that strives to empower the Hispanic community and just raise STEM awareness in general. And so, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here today. But I'm also joined alongside Anais. Yeah, hi everybody, I'm Anais. I'm a sophomore in chemical and biomedical engineering and I'm also co-community outreach chair of SHIP. Nice to see you all. Yeah, and today we'll be more learning more about core research in biomechanics and biorobotics. We'll specifically look at, for example, how some animals have influenced animal behaviors and structures in engineering design and how you can start doing your own research and projects involving biomechanics and biorobotics. To start off, you probably come across these concepts already, but we wanna gauge your preliminary physics knowledge. And so some questions on the Zoom polls are gonna pop up, feel free to answer those. But we'll start off with the first question, which is what best describes a force? A push and pull, a movement, a resistance to movement, or Star Wars? So I'll give you around 30 seconds to answer that and then we'll share the results. Okay. So it seems like 60% of us said push and pull, which is the right answer. And another way to think of a force though is an interaction that causes the motion of an object. And one example of a force can include gravity, and it's what's keeping us all, you know, pulled towards the earth. But, you know, if gravity is the only force being exerted on you, why aren't you falling through the earth? And if you didn't know, that's because there's another force acting on your body. And that force is known as, known as the normal force. And it's what opposes the force of gravity and is what, like I said, prevents you from just falling through the earth. It's important to note that a force is measured in newtons. And so keep that in mind as we go through the rest of the session. But on to the next question, question two. What force acts on all bodies no matter where they are on earth? Feel free to answer. It's either, you know, gravity, gravity, friction. <laughs> the magnetic force so 100 percent gravity so far okay friction in there magnetic force okay <clears throat> so yeah almost everyone answered gravity which is the right answer um, you know, it's a force is actually acted upon by all masses on in the universe. And gravity is what gives objects its weight. And in the US particularly, we use pounds to denote mass and weight. But outside the US in the in the metric system, we use newtons for the unit of force and weight, since force and weight are essentially the same thing. And since weight is a measure of the force that the earth is exerting on you, if I, for example, were to weigh 253 pounds on Jupiter, I'd actually weigh 17 pounds on the moon because the moon is exerting a smaller amount of gravity on me or a smaller magnitude of gravity on me. And so, yeah, keeping that in mind, we'll move on to the third question, which just got launched and is, what weighs more, 10 pounds of feathers or 10 pounds of gold? Maybe a trick question, but, you know, give it your best shot. <laughs> Go 
glad to see that a lot of people have taken away, you know, some knowledge from these sessions. That's really cool. Yeah, and the correct answer, there's actually two of them. They weigh the same amount because they're both 10 pounds. And as I mentioned before, weight is just a measure of, you know, how strong the earth pulls on an object. But yeah, they actually have the same mass because they do have the same weight. And since the force of gravity is just a product of mass and acceleration, we see that the amount of weight and mass is just exactly the same. And so moving on to the last question, um, let's see, question four, what does this equation calculate? The poll is up and just so you know, it's the backbone of all mechanics and it's pretty important, especially since we're talking about biomechanics, so yeah. Very nice, 100% on force. <laughs> okay, yeah. As we've mentioned before, force is measured in Newtons, which is why the N is there for the units. And it's also the product of mass and acceleration. And so with all this in mind, let's make sure we just all have a common definition for biomechanics. And so what does biomechanics mean again? Well, breaking down the word itself, biology just refers to the study of living organisms, while mechanics refers to the study of the interaction and movement between objects. And so it's actually one of the first things you'll study when you take a physics class in high school. So putting that together, biomechanics is the study of movement and forces of animals, humans, or biologically inspired robots. And biomechanics connects medicine, robotics, physical therapy, engineering, and a lot more. In these two pictures, you'll see F equals MA pop up again because there's different forces being exerted on the runner as he starts accelerating forward. And you also see how different forces come into play to maintain the stability of the dinosaur as he stands up. You can see different forces acting on his bones and everything and on his legs. And so, yeah, I mean, biomechanics has been around for, if anything, hundreds and thousands of years millennia. And to start off our study of biomechanics, we'll study the biomechanics of snakes and more specifically their movements. Snakes exhibit different types of locomotion by moving different types of muscle groups. And locomotion just refers to the ability to move from one place to another. On the right, we see the four most common types of snake locomotion. They could be concertina, which is when the snake moves its head inwards and pushes it back out. Or in other words, the first diagram on the right. Sidewinding is when the snake throws its head forward and its body follows. So the snake moves forward sideways, while caterpillar, or rather sidewinding is when the snake throws its head forward and the snake kind of wiggles around and caterpillar is finally when the snake's muscles contract to move forward in a rippling motion. And to better see how the snake moves, we'll take a short look at this clip. It was discovered that snakes also make use of directional friction and weight distribution. Like most people, you probably think snakes are slimy. So how do these smooth, scaled reptiles generate friction? Well, contrary to popular belief, snakes aren't slimy. In fact, they may even feel a bit rough. Snake scales are smooth to minimize the forces of friction when they slide forward. Conversely, when snakes slide backwards or sideways, the overlapping scales, which resemble roof shingles, dig into the ground, causing frictional resistance to occur. If the friction exerted by the snake is equal in all directions, snakes just oscillate in place, meaning they'll go through the motions, but won't be able to go anywhere. 
The scale's frictional anisotropy, or resistance to sliding in certain directions, helps the snake push itself forward. Also, scientists have discovered that snakes, through muscle movement, can change the angle their scales meet the ground. A larger angle generates more friction, while a smaller angle generates less. Weight distribution is also important in snake locomotion. If you closely examine a moving snake, you'll see that their body doesn't always remain in contact with the ground. Instead, snakes lift parts of their body off the surface to direct their weight on specific points. This is comparable to how humans shift their weight from heel to toe in order to run faster. It still isn't completely understood how snakes move. But it's important to keep learning about this because there are so many potential applications. Yeah, and so as we saw from the video, friction is a force that plays a big role in snake movement. And friction is just a force that resists the movement of objects. And so because the snake scales exhibit friction in various directions, the snake's muscle movements allow it to optimize its movement and just exhibit different types of locomotion as we saw, or as we see in the diagram on the right. By moving its muscles in different types of ways, the snake can optimize its movement for whatever environment can it needs to adapt to. And so the video also mentioned though, that there's plenty of applications for this kind of movement. And as we'll see, snakes have actually inspired a lot of robotic design. And in this clip, we'll take a look at some of the snake-inspired robots developed at Carnegie Mellon. Some applications include search and rescue. Here we see a snake robot being powered by a tether coming out the roof of this abandoned building. It's a disaster site. And so, you know, the snake needs to navigate through a lot of tight volumes and small spaces. And in a disaster site like this, it's really important to just maintain the security of all the humans and rescuers involved. Another thing about this robotic design is that it has a camera in the front and a microphone, meaning that the rescuers can communicate with, you know, whoever is in the building and get a sense of the damage done inside the building. We also see here how it's easy to deploy because the dog can easily just run through the site, deploy the robot, drop it down, and the snake can just move around just like it would in nature. Another application includes scouting and recon. Here we see how the snake is able to move to high vantage points. And with this camera, it just provides surveillance and everything. We also see more closely how the snake is composed of a lot of different links. And those are actually a lot of different motors that actuate and allow for the type of snake robotic movement. And yeah, another thing is that it allows for the versatile different types of motion as we see here. It can spin, it can roll, it could climb. It could swim. And so, yeah, these snake robots have a lot of applications. And we'll take a look at a way or other ways in which other animals have influenced engineering design. But yeah, these are just a few examples of how snake robots could be used for things such as search and rescue and scouting and navigation. So in this clip, we'll see how a hobby as simple as bird watching can inspire innovation and creativity. In 1989, Japan's Shinkansen bullet train had a problem. It was fast, really fast, like pushing 170 miles per hour fast. But every time it exited a tunnel, it was loud. The noise was coming from a variety of sources, but whenever a train sped into a tunnel, it pushed waves of atmospheric pressure through the other end. The air exited tunnels with a sonic boom that could be heard 400 meters away. In dense residential areas, that was a huge problem. So an engineering team was brought in to design a quieter, faster, and more efficient train. And they had one secret weapon. Eiji Nakatsu, the general manager of the technical development department, was a bird watcher. Different components of the redesigned bullet train were based on different birds. 
Owls inspired the pantograph. That's the rig that connects the train to the electric wires above. Nakatsu modeled the redesign after their feathers, reducing noise by using the same serrations and curvature that allow them to silently swoop down to catch prey. The Adeli penguin, whose smooth body allows it to swim and slide effortlessly, inspired the pantograph's supporting shaft, redesigned for lower wind resistance. And perhaps most notable of all was the kingfisher. The kingfisher is a bird that dives into water to catch its prey. The unique shape of its beak allows it to do that while barely making a splash. Nakatsu took that shape to the design table. The team shot bullets shaped like different train nose models down a pipe to measure pressure waves and dropped them into water to measure the splash size. The quietest nose design was the one modeled most closely after the kingfisher's beak. When the redesign debuted in 1997, it was 10% faster, used 15% less electricity, and stayed under the 70 decibel noise limit in residential areas. And it did all that with the wings of an owl, the belly of a penguin, and the nose of a kingfisher. There's a name for design like this. It's called biomimicry. Yeah, and biomimicry actually can reach as far as space as we'll see next. So bio-inspired design, as we just saw, can inspire something like the design of the latest bullet train, but it could also inspire the cutting edge spacecraft that's gonna explore Venus. And so maybe you're aware of this, but Venus is actually Earth's sister planet. And we refer to Venus as that because Venus has a similar mass and density to Earth. But yeah, the Breeze mission concept is an idea for a Stingray-inspired spacecraft. It's innovative in the sense that it adopts the skeletal structure of a Stingray to reduce the amount of power needed for navigation and long-term flight. So yeah, imagine a Stingray just flying through Venus, you know, a planet millions of miles away. And so let's take a closer look at the actual design. Previous Venus missions relied on balloons and gas tanks for flotation and altitude control. But as you can see here, this bio-inspired design eliminates the need for all that extra mass. If anything, all you need is a set of kind of flapping wings, and that's exactly what the spacecraft exhibits. It mimics the behavior of a stingray for thrust generation through the Venetian atmosphere. And the size of the aircraft can do twisting and flapping just like a stingray can. And the design also takes advantage of the strong winds in the Venusian atmosphere. And all of this is controlled through the use of a tension-based system, as you can see in the middle of the diagram on the top. Those wires adjust accordingly to move around different types of forces and allow for the twisting and the flapping of the wings. Here's how the movement would actually look. Here we see just a stingray just flapping its, you know, the side of the sides. And yeah, just imagine that in the middle of the Venusian atmosphere. It's pretty cool. Um, but here's a closer look at the design as a whole. We see the different types of forces, such as drag and thrust acting on the actual vehicle, lift as well. On the bottom, we also see a diagram of how it navigates the Venusian atmosphere and take advantage of those different winds throughout Venus. And so let's take a look at another example of biomechanics though. And in this case, inflatable robots with skin. Maybe you do remember Big Hero 6, but here's a quick clip to just remind you of, you know, the Disney movie that came out in 2014. while I let out some air. Are you done? Yes. So yeah, in this movie, Baymax was a robot whose purpose was to be a healthcare provider. And he's also depicted to be an inflatable robot. And the whole concept behind Baymax was actually developed at CMU. So let's study a bit more of the biomechanics behind Baymax's development at CMU. The biomechanics of Baymax's arm. It's the perfect example of how mechanics and biology come together because here we see, for example, 
artificial muscles and joints come into play, as well as artificial skin. Those artificial muscles are encompassed. Those white tubes can mimic the flexion and relaxation of muscles. And they do this through the inflation of those tubes. By inflating those tubes as necessary, the designers can actually cause the opening and closing of the robotic hand. Another thing you'll notice is that depending on the amount of air pressure in those tubes, different amounts of forces are going to be exerted throughout the arm. And that's why on the left, we see a little graph showing contraction and forces and how they relate to each other. And in the middle of the picture, you also see how joints are encompassed by different types of motors. And motors in general and robotic design are really prevalent and really useful. And so what does Baymax actually look like though? Well, here he is. Here's a quick clip of what he actually looks like. You can see the inflatable, I guess, skin. And on the right, you see a picture of him without I guess his mask and everything. You know, not too appealing, but definitely still a work in development and it's ongoing work still occurring at CMU. And so if you want to learn more, definitely talk to Anais and I after this session. But yeah, now that you've been exposed a bit more to just examples of biomechanics in general, Anais is going to talk about how you can get involved and how you can start doing your own research in biomechanics. So yeah, hopefully, so what you got from Sebastian's part is that biomechanics is basically everywhere. So a way you can kind of start looking into your interest, hopefully you're interested um, in biomechanics is reading up on the real world and more research being done on the field. So it doesn't even have to be kind of medical related. I mean, or kind of biological related, I mean, but reading up can really help you kind of harness your creativity. It can kind of help you look further into your interests. And as we know, creativity kind of spurs innovation. So definitely read up on new skills, read up on what's happening in the world and research going on in the field if you're interested. I actually put some kind of resources you guys can start looking at in an Excel, it should be on Canvas. So you guys should check that out. But yeah, um, another reason kind of reading is important is because for example, I in high school liked reading kind of random articles on animal behavior. And that's how I kind of got my first glimpse into the field of biomechanics. Um, it was in a National Geographic magazine and I read an article about um, robotics that were inspired by octopuses, actually, which is, I think somebody in two sessions will talk about that. So that's really interesting, too. But that's kind of what got me involved in bioengineering and my first interest in that. So something else you guys can also start looking into is learning how to code. Um, if you guys already have started with that, that's really cool. But learning how to code can actually help you in a lot of fields, not only in STEM, surprisingly. Um, I know a few people that are in humanities and have had to learn how to code for their classes. So coding is really kind of interesting and it's also kind of helpful no matter where you are. And another thing you guys can start doing is practicing your writing skills. And that's something else reading can help you with. Um, practicing your writing skills, there's kind of that myth that STEM majors don't have to know how to write. And that's a complete lie, take it from me. Um, we write a lot actually, especially if, you're go or if you wanna go into research, definitely work on that. Another thing you guys can start doing is looking into clubs in your schools or around you, science clubs, engineering clubs. One of the ways that I first got into kind of biomedical and bioengineering is actually in high school through a club called NASA Swarmathon. And in this club, we kind of, uh, we have to develop an algorithm. And this algorithm was based on ants 
and the way that ants kind of search for food. And when they find the food, they leave a pheromone track to attract other ants. So these swarmies, as shown in the picture, were kind of based on the behavior of these ants. So when they found like a rock in space or whatever, they would leave or kind of leave a trail for other swarmies to kind of go in that area and look around that area. And if there's not that many science clubs or engineering clubs around you, don't be scared to make the club. It's not that bad. It's not as scary as it seems. And kind of just whatever your interest is, I'm sure other people in your school or other people around you are interested in it too. So don't be scared to make a club. And a third advice I would give you is to look into summer camps around you. It's kind of a way to know what you like, know what you're interested in. And I have two links there. Sebastian, can you click on the Calteach one? So yeah, uh, one of the, I was looking around for summer camps for you guys. If you guys were interested, they'll be on the Excel sheet. And one of them is actually similar to this biomechanics. Uh, this is for all ages and it has a bunch of sessions on biomechanics and just biology and how to get started too. There's a lot of college readiness sessions in this program and you guys can still sign up and it's virtual. So great opportunity, it's free if you guys wanna check that out. Some other programs are actually at CMU has a lot of them. There's two in specific that I found really interesting. There's one in artificial intelligence, if you guys want to look into that. This one's for high schoolers or kind of upper high schoolers. But if you're interested, it's a really awesome opportunity to get hands-on experience. And there's also another one on computational biology, another way to kind of get introduced to the field and really awesome opportunity if you guys like that. So yeah, there's many more on the Excel sheet and I kind of wanted to leave the ground open to see if you guys had any questions. We have like one minute left, but. Yeah, our contact information is gonna be found on the Canvas page soon. So feel free to reach out. Again, we appreciate your time. Thanks for showing up and being here with us. But thank you, yeah. Hopefully you guys learned or took away a few things from this. Awesome, thanks Sebastian and Anais, that was a ton of fun. I am always wishing that I could go back to summer camps. Those were such a blast. So thank you for sharing that list. And again, all of those resources are up on Canvas. So if you would like to um, take a look at that list, think about where you wanna spend your summer, definitely go look at the Canvas. Um, these folks did a really good job of putting all those resources together for us.